pray that this is a day where you experience God's presence and God is exalted and glorified in all that we say and do. So let me open us up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your mercy and your grace and how you bless us and encourage us. And we pray, Lord, you would use this day in whatever way you desire to draw us closer to you and give us a clear understanding and a desire to serve you and follow you faithfully. Thank you for loving us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chelsea? All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be back. You know, it is nice to have a nice little break, but it is nice to come back to worship with you. Why don't we stand and we'll begin.
Well, good morning. This being the uh, first Sunday of the month, we're going to spend some time just observing the Lord's Supper as a reminder of the sacrifice that our Savior gave for us. I want to uh, read a word of Scripture, and then we'll enter time of prayer and have an observance of this ordinance. So it says in Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 14, beginning in verse 22, while they were eating, he took some bread, and after blessing, he, after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had given a cup and given thanks, he said to them, and he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it in new with you in the kingdom of God. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Chris, would you lead us in a prayer for the elements? Now for this time where we can come and celebrate in this ordinance and just what it represents of you dying on the cross for our sins, dear Lord. And just come now with, with our sins repented and just uh, that forgiveness that you give us. And again, just thank you for this time in your precious name. Amen. Amen. And as we just read, Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, this cup is poured out for you in a new covenant in my blood. Remember that as often as you drink it, this do in remembrance of me. And as we just read after that, they sang a hymn, and that's what we're going to do. So, or some sort of song, anyway. <laughs> Continue with worship. Once again, and thank you for joining us, here, rather here in person or those watching on the live stream. Um, in front of you, if you're in person, you should have a connection card. If you're first time visiting with us, fill out your information on the on the front. And for everybody on the back side, is a place for prayer re requests, praises, updates, whatever it need be. And if you haven't filled out, as we come around shortly with the offering plates to collect. You can drop it in there. Those requests will be prayed upon throughout the remainder of our service today and in the weeks ahead as they'll be added to our list. Um, speaking of, you know, like I said, we'll be gathering our offering here just shortly, so join me in prayer. Dear Lord, just thank you now for this time where we can come and 
collect this offering to help further your kingdom, dear Lord, and then go into the word that you presented to Pastor Mike to preach to us today, dear Lord, and come with open minds, open hearts, and open ears to be receptive to your word. And if today's the day that somebody hasn't come to know you as Savior, that something in the message will they'll feel you knocking and come accept that, that acceptance, dear Lord. And uh, just, again, be with us throughout the rest of this, this service in your precious name. Amen. Well, good morning, folks. Hope everyone's doing well this morning and uh, enjoying the days ahead. So had a very busy day here at the church yesterday. Had some, a lot of folks come in and helped us as we did some cleanup that you probably noticed some things look a little different around the outside of the church. A lot of folks worked hard yesterday, grateful to their sacrifice on giving up their Saturday morning. So, uh, and afternoon, it went for a way. Some went into the evening, I believe. We're still here trying to work when it was all said and done. But anyway, uh, that's kind of what's been going on. Just continue to pray for one another. Obviously, a couple of things probably on everybody's heart uh, to be praying for. We know what's been going on uh, in the south of us with the storms and the recovery that's been going on. Continue to pray for those that are working in that. And many of you may have heard uh, that uh, the young man who was very involved in our church years ago, Hunter Suter, his, do- his sister passed away in a tragic car accident last week. There'll be more information about the services and things of that nature, but please pray for that family. Uh, that he is a young man that has been dating Madison Wilkin. Many of you know Maddie uh, around here, so be praying for that family as well. So just a couple things I wanted to mention as we kind of enter into this time in, in God's Word, and we'll spend some time in prayer. If you have your copy of God's Word, we'll be in 2 John. We're going to cover a whole letter today. It's so small we can do that, right? It's only 13 verses. So anyway, if you would and are able, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word this morning, 2 John, that we'll read through the entire, entire text here this morning. And the apostle writes, he says, The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. For God, the Father, and from Jesus Christ, and the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you and I have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, and those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, that you do not lose what you have accomplished, for that you may receive a full reward. Verse 9, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. And the one who does, who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching... You do not receive him into your house and do not give him greeting. For the one who gives him greeting participates in his evil deeds. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. Would you pray with me, Father? We thank you for your word. Thank you for how you speak to us today, and I pray, Father, you would use me as your vessel to faithfully communicate your word to each of us, your children. We lift up these Uh, families that are dealing with so many challenges and and struggles in our midst and also those uh, outside of uh, our immediate fellowship, but our brothers and sisters and others who are struggling so greatly. We pray for those that are ministering to them, and we pray, Father, that we will keep them forever in our prayers, that they will be encouraged and strengthened by your grace and your might and your power. Bless this time and use it, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right. You know, there are some times in life when following Jesus can be a challenge, aren't there? When doing what the scriptures have commanded us to do and encouraged us to do can be difficult. It may get in the way of some things that we would like to do. It may even cause friction in relationships that we have, either our immediate family or coworkers and friends and others of that nature. It may put us at odds with the society in which we live. I think we live in such days. Does that make sense for all of us? There are times it's a challenge. There's times it's not going according to those those things. There's other times in your walk, you ever had those moments we call them mountaintop experiences when everything seems to be going great? And you're like, you're, you're looking ahead, everything's going great, and then something always seems to happen, doesn't it? 
And the next thing you know, you're struggling, you're frustrated, you may be angry at God, you may be struggling with your faith, you may even have doubts about God's very existence and love for you in the midst of that. We kind of go with this ebb and flow in our walk with him. It would be great if our walk with him started off at salvation and baptism and all those things that we do, and then we just kind of went on this this crescendo straight forward with no pitfalls, but unfortunately life doesn't work that way, does it? Fortunately, you're going along and you have things that come into life that cause you to struggle, things that may cause you to doubt or become frustrated, things that lead us astray from the path that God has for us. Oftentimes, we, we want to be on that path. We want to be focused in that direction, but then we see things and we shift here and there. That's part of human nature, part of the struggle that we have in our walk. And I'm not excusing that. I'm not saying, oh, well, that's just the way it is. You got to deal with it. But I am believing, and I think John is trying to equip and encourage these believers that's a part of the struggle. But what's more important about that is being faithful. And how do, you, how do you do that? How do you stay the course when so many things in life are trying to lead you on a different path? And I think John gives us some insights that we'll look in at this morning in this text. But the heart of it, he really begins as he describes it. And we, we, we looked through 1 John the last several weeks, and now we're kind of in the second letter, which is very brief. And uh, many scholars believe this obviously came later. Uh, you know, because usually when you're writing something, you write the bigger thing first, and then it gets, you know, when you know someone, it's, it's less and less uh, to, to communicate with them. And so he's kind of sharing these little thoughts, and the focus of it really is obedience and what it looks like to have a relationship with God. And we know that principle, we understand that principle, that if we love someone, we'll do what they say. That's what we tell our kids, don't we? Oh, really? Now, if you tell your kids that? Yeah, you do. You encourage them. You, you lovingly say, listen to me, you know. And when they don't listen, and I'm sure that no one has ever had children that didn't listen to them, right? Or didn't do what they said. If, if we're in this room and we're honest, and when we were children, for many of us, that was a long time ago. I know it was a many years for me. I, I can testify there were many times my mother told me to do something or my dad told me to do something. And I did exactly the opposite. But I'm sure I'm the only one in this room that's ever done that. No, I know that's not true. But I mean, that's what we struggle with. And, but that did not change that relationship. It, it caused some, some strife, difficulty, and punishment on my part, but that's okay. That's just what happens as a part of, of child rearing and, and life. But what we have to do in our walk with him is obey, because obedience, obedience does demonstrate love. I mean, the very marriage vows that many of us took when we became husband and wife have so much of that, and it's been stricken from some that all obey, but, and, and some people say, well, that's sexist, but the idea is if you love someone, you want to please them. You want to encourage them. You want to do things that uplift them. You don't want to do things that separate you or cause division, do you, with the person that you love? And it's, it's funny because over the years, many years, I've done a lot of premarital counseling in, with various things. And I've also, I, like I used to joke, I, I did a lot more premarital counseling when I was a campus minister at a college campus than I did as a pastor. But a lot of times I'd have discussions with, with students and they would, you know, these, these are 20-somethings and they're, they're, they, they've been dating and they're ready to get married, so they think, and maybe they are. And some of them did get married and they're still married today, which is amazing and wonderful. But it's interesting to have these discussions. Uh, I'd hear all sorts of things that I will not repeat because you don't want to hear it and it would bore you. And some of it's probably not appropriate for me to repeat in a, in a gathering like this, but Issues that they would have where people would be mad at one another. And if you notice that happens in relationships that when people disagree, they sometimes get frustrated and maybe a little angry. And if you can imagine college students doing that, they do that as well. And, and, that's, and anger is not a, we, we have this kind of mindset, I think, sometimes in relationships and in life. And we kind of, even as Baptists, we're probably guilty of this, that anger is evil. And that's not biblically true. There is a time that anger is necessary. I mean, there's things with sin that is necessary. And there are times in relationships when you have two people who are completely different people, not automatons who just function that way, you're going to have some strife at times. And for some of you, if you're at the beginning of that, and you're like, oh, that never would happen to us. <laughs> Sorry. Those of us that have been together with others a lot longer and have spouses, we know that's just a part of it. There's an ebb and flow to it. There's struggles. There's challenges. That doesn't mean because you have strife and difficulty that you suddenly hate each other, but it means you have challenges. You may have different ways of seeing things. I mean, people forget that when you bring a couple together, you bring in two completely different people who have had been raised differently, live different lives, have different perspectives, and now these two are commanded by Scripture to become one. That doesn't mean that they become identical twins all of a sudden. 
and think exactly alike. It's a struggle. And sometimes in that, we, we get frustrated. Unfortunately, some folks think, well, if, I, if they're not like me and don't, you know, that, that's why I think it's that, that key principle that's laid out in Scripture that believers should marry believers because everything else is enough of a challenge. Let's at least be right and correct on that, right? And so, I mean, the heart of this really and what John's trying to say in this relationship as we walk with God is understanding that key principle that we are his children. We are bound in that relationship, as he says. We are you know, I love that greeting in verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. May we just experience that grace because sometimes when we're struggling with people and things aren't going the way that we think they should, we need grace and we need to share and give some grace. Does that make sense? We need to understand and extend that grace that has been given to, extended to us. We need to extend that to others. And that's hard sometimes because we can get caught up in, especially in, in those close and intimate personal relationships, feelings can become very strong, and sometimes those feelings can become very dangerous. You become comfortable with someone, you might say some things that you would never say to anyone else. I'm sure my wife has said things to me that she would never say to another human, and I have done the same. Because I am comfortable with her, and she is comfortable with me. We, we respect and love one another. Does that mean that we're going to always see things exactly the same? Absolutely not. And that's okay. In a body like this, I'm going to gather there's a few different opinions about various topics and issues in here. Would that be fair to say? We're not going to see everything the same way. Does that mean we disrespect one another when we disagree? No, that's a part of being human and a part of growing, and we learn to grow in community. And one of the things in the marital relationship and I saw him camping out there, but I think, I think John's kind of talking about this, is this idea that we are now two, and now we become one. We become united, not unified. There's a difference between unification and unity. Huge difference. Not just politically, but every, in every aspect of life. And sometimes, because to me, when I think of unified, I think of uniformity, and that isn't always what I think God's looking for. He's looking for unity. That means that we may be different, we may have different approaches, but we are one in our focus that we realize that Jesus Christ is Lord and we want to do whatever we can to exalt him. And we may come at it from different angles and in different ways, and that's okay, as long as our central focus is Christ and Christ alone and his exaltation. That's why we have so many different churches in the world. Did you know that? In our community, we have a lot of different churches. Now, some are different, the differentiation is, is, is doctrinal on some, I understand that, but some, most of it is preference, personalities, a lot of things get and cause different groups to emerge in a community like, like ours and others in the, in the world. But the focus of all of the churches, my hope, any church that is a church that professes to be Christ-like, Christian, focusing on the teachings, is that focus. We want to exalt, glorify our Savior. Everything we do is about Him. Does that mean we're going to do it? Does that even mean we're going to sing the same songs? Does it mean we're going to sing the same songs the same way? Does it mean we're going to observe the Lord's Supper the same way? Probably not. I've been in other traditions where they do it quite differently. Am I comfortable in it? Not always. I can remember many years ago when I got to do, uh, uh, lead the Lord's Supper in a church in El Salvador because it was around the Easter season and that's what they did. And the, the young lady that was the education pastor was there, and she did not feel comfortable leading the church. This was her decision in that, and the senior pastor was gone. And so she was there, and she said, can you do this? I'm like, if you have a translator, I can do this. And I said, I'll probably do it the way I always do it. And I don't know if it's going to be, but I had to shift it a little bit because it was just a little, it wasn't major, but it was a little different, but it was an incredible experience for me in the way that they did that. They had a time of confession and prayer before we did the, I mean, literally, where they would get, everybody, they didn't have to come down, but everybody would stand where they were or kneel where they were in their pews, and they would have a time. And, and it was interesting, because when we pray, we pray silently, don't we? In this gathering, they did not pray silently. Everybody prayed at the same time. In Spanish, what do you think that sounded like to my little Anglo ears here? It sounded crazy. I didn't understand, because I didn't understand. What the, I couldn't understand them one-on-one. -on -one. How am I going to understand 150 people talking at the same time? But it was an incredible experience of what I thought about. It was, it was, I mean, God got it all. He figured out. He heard every single word that was said from every believer. 
And that was that sense of unity. It really bonded them. And it was a beautiful experience. It's one of my favorite experiences of, of the Lord's Supper. I don't, think, I don't think I could ever top that. It was just an amazing thing to do and be a part of as, as someone who's been, able, been privileged to serve in this capacity for many years. But I think of that, that body and how they taught me something I wasn't expecting in such a simple thing as that, that idea of God's ability to focus in and hear us in prayer, even though to us, it sounds like chaos. Now that bothers us because some, some, some of us don't like noise. My mother hates noise. She can't stand more than two people talking in a room at the same time because she has hearing issues, you know, and some deafness that's going on, and so she struggles with that. But God doesn't struggle with that. I mean, right now today across the world, brothers and sisters in Christ are praying, speaking to God in a variety of expressions and ways, a variety of languages and cultural trappings, and our creator, our redeemer, our savior is glorified and exalted and participating in all of it. Have you ever thought about that, what that must be like, that he can do that? That he can focus on what's going on in Uganda right now and also what's going on in Frederick. Now, they may be asleep in Uganda right now, probably are a time difference, I don't know. I don't know, they're a little bit ahead of us, but I'm just saying, you don't understand what I'm saying. He's able to do that as we worship him. In our own country, we have worship in a variety of cultural expressions and languages, and God is able to focus on it all together. Anyway, I've, I've kind of hammered that a little bit. Let's move on with this text. There's so much here that he talks about that we want to get into, but the real focus is that if we follow and we love God, we will obey him, which is one of the texts that comes out of John's gospel where he talks about that. If you love God, you will obey his commandments. It's a very key principle in what it means to be a follower of Christ. Yet there were some in that day that had taken this idea and that Gnosticism that we've talked about ad nauseum in the church was present where people believed that they could live as long as they had given their lives to Christ, entrusted Christ, done the rituals that they could live in whatever way they wanted outside of that. And that means do some things that we would obviously, if we looked at, we'd think that's just abhorrent. That's evil. That's vile. But yet they thought that was okay because the soul was saved so they didn't have to worry about what they did with the body. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of spiritual Gnosticism at work in the church today in America. It's okay to proclaim this. And unfortunately, we've seen this happen among People in, in, in position like mine, pastors across this country that have done that, that have lived, have, have proclaimed the truth and yet lived a completely different life behind closed doors. And that's a scary thing. And I know for all of us, we have issues, we have struggles, we have things that can lead us astray from the path that God has for us. But the good thing is, is that the Holy Spirit can empower us, can convict us, can move us in the direction that we need to be, and we have to learn to trust and surrender to him. As he leads us. All right, let's continue to move on here. Because John makes it pretty clear. He, notice he addresses this lady. He talked about it in verse one, and he's talking to the church when he says that. And he goes on, Now I ask you, lady, talking to the church again, he says in verse five, Not though as I was writing a new commandment, but the one that we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Have you noticed how that commandment keeps turning up in the scriptures a lot? It's all throughout the New Testament. Love one another. Why do you think that happens is, is so is emphasized so much again and again throughout the New Testament. You think people had a problem with loving one another? Do we not have a problem sometimes with loving one another? And I'm just talking about in the fellowship. I'm not talking about loving everybody outside the four walls of the church, but within the body. Sometimes we struggle with that. Does loving one another mean, that's, that's the issue. What does it mean? Don't take it, and I always pick on this because like I said as a kid, my mom watched soap operas and I watched way too many of them with her in the summer. And these are the ones from the 70s, you know. I think As the World Turns was the big one. It's probably still on. You know, that was her thing. And Guiding Light was another one. I don't remember. There's a bunch of others. We'll leave it alone at that. Those are just some of the goofy things. And, and everybody on those shows was in love with everybody. Have you noticed that? And there's always one guy on all those shows that's in love with every woman on that show that's above 12. You know, I mean, he is. And he's the guy or whatever that all the women think he's the greatest or whatever. But... That's not the kind of love I'm talking about. Let's just put it, that, put it very clearly. That's the love as the world defines it. That's a warped opinion and approach to love because that's the love that's very self-centered. It's about if you love me, you'll do what I say. It's not godly love. It's man's love. And it's what we've, we've warped it into. Satan has tricked us and taught us that if we would love that way, that's the way you're supposed to find satisfaction in life. But life is not about us, is it? It's not about us having our way all the time. Because someone that gets their way all the time will become what? 
Yeah, you know, I'll say it, a spoiled brat. How's that? You wanted to say it, but you didn't want you to think you'd offend somebody. But that's what happens. And we do that with our children. We know we can't give our children their way all the time we, because we love them. We want them to learn how to adjust and to figure things out and that you just don't get your way all the time. And I think in the body of Christ, that has always been a struggle for us because whenever people are gathered together, there's always this kind of intersection and cross-section of wills, desires, agendas. We don't like to talk about that, but they are present in us. And I think God is trying to help these believers and us today as well understand that, guys and ladies, it's okay to think that way, but let me help you. That's not going to work in life. It never will. That's not the way I have called you and set you apart. I have called you and set you apart to be my people, to be a part of my agenda, to follow me. And by me, I don't mean Mike. I mean by, by God is saying that. We follow him, right? And it is his agenda, his purpose, his plan for us that sets us apart as the church of Jesus Christ. And that is always a struggle because we, we are strong-willed people outside of, in life in general, aren't we? How many of us like getting our way? All of us. No, not me. No, not me. I, I'm, I'm more noble, right? That's what we would say. No, no, you're not. I love people that try to say that, and it's hilarious because they're just lying to you. That's a form of trying to get you to, get to come along with them. Anyway, but it's a manipulation, but that's, anyway, move on. That's too much to get into today. But our call to love him and to follow him is so important. And that's what he's talking about, loving one another. And he talks about that in verse, and he says in verse 6, this is love. What, that we, just do the, that we just go to church and sing? No, he says this is love that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment that you heard from the beginning and the show should walk in. And then he gets into this whole section where he talks about some people that are coming into the church, that are impacting the church. He begins in verse 7 where he talks about these false teachers. He calls them deceivers. They've gone out of the world. They do not acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. There are hallmarks of the faith that when anyone teaches, they must acknowledge these things if they want to be called a Christian, right? Just because they have prophet, rabbi, teacher, whatever behind their, in front of their name doesn't make them a follower of God or a follower of Christ. Titles are worthless. I'm going to say it. They just are. What matters is what comes out of your mouth and what you believe and what you live, and so what he is implying here is there were some that were trying to teach and they had gone out even in the midst of the church, but they did not believe that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. They thought Jesus is, that's that whole, he's talking about Gnosticism again here, that whole idea that Jesus was just kind of like this spirit. And there were some that even so far as that Jesus didn't really die on the cross, that someone else took his place. What is the point of our salvation if Jesus Christ doesn't die on the cross? Doesn't, we don't have any. Without his death on the cross, I have no hope of salvation. Zero. None. It is only because of the finished work of Christ, what Jesus has done, his suffering, his blood, for me and for you, for all those who receive him, that is the only hope that I have in salvation. And yet some were trying to distract people, and John is warning against that. He's telling them to watch themselves, do not lose what you've accomplished that you may receive your full reward, he says in verse 8. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide the teaching of Christ does not have God. That's pretty strong, isn't it? It's, but it's truth. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, he's talking about this whole idea of teaching that Jesus is, is the Christ. Do not receive him into your house. Do not give him greeting. For the one who gives him greeting participates in deal. Shun these people, I guess is one way, I guess... The Amish would give us a good term for that, right? Shun them. Get, don't acknowledge them. Ignore them. Have no part with them. Because they are teaching a, this was the doctrine of the Antichrist. Did you hear him say that earlier? He did. And I think he's right. A lot of times we think the doctrine of the Antichrist is some satanic thing where we'll be at rituals and all that. But it's denying who Jesus is. Denying Jesus as the Christ, as our Messiah, as the Son of God is ant Antichrist. It's satanic. It is a violation of the truth of God's word and who Christ claimed to be. Jesus, and I love these little debates, these, these debates that, you know, that Jesus never claimed to be God on YouTube. They're hilarious. Some people have some of the weirdest thoughts. If they would read the Bible, it's pretty clear Jesus claimed it. He said it more than once in multiple ways. He wanted us to understand that he is. When he, when he declares himself first the son of God, that is not like the generic we think, well, we're all children of God, Right? 
Now, that's a very specific title he gives himself. In fact, the title Son of Man in the New Testament, and you, anybody ever heard Jesus meant to call himself the Son of Man? Sure you have. That's a loaded title. That's a title reserved for the Messiah. And is the understanding of scriptures of who the Messiah was, that he was God's chosen one, Jesus is kind of helping understand, well, it's more than that, boys and girls. I am the Son of God. When he goes, I love when he has that discussion with the Pharisees, and, and they're like, you know, well, who can forgive sins but God alone? He goes, gotcha, yeah, you got it. You got it right. I mean, Jesus didn't say, no, I can't forgive sins. You're right. I was just saying that to make you all feel better. No, he testifies that he has the right and the authority to forgive sins. Why? Because only God can forgive sins, right? Jesus is God, so he can forgive sins. Only he can, yes. I mean, he is making it clear. On so many occasions, our Savior makes it clear, and John is wanting these believers, I think, in a, to understand that, that that is the teaching that Jesus is who he declares to be. Beware of those that try to tell you Jesus is less than or other than what the Scriptures teach than who he te- professes to be. In our world today, unfortunately, we have some, even some in pulpits of churches across our land that declare the false gospel because it's not comfortable. It doesn't make them feel, I don't know what their reasoning is. Maybe it doesn't make sense to them. I have a very renowned pastor who doesn't believe in the Trinity. Really? So you don't believe in the Bible? Well, and I've, he's been cornered on that, and he just, oh, I believe in the Bible. Then you don't believe in the Trinity, but you said you don't, you don't believe in the Trinity, but you, don't, you believe in the Bible. He's like, I believe in the Bible. No, you don't. You just believe in the portions of the Bible that you want. And I'm not, that can happen to any one of us if we're not careful. There are going to be texts that you will read. If you read, if you follow us, read through the Bible, and you're, you're going to read stuff in there that you didn't know was in there sometimes. You're going to wonder, I don't, what am I reading this for? There's some stuff in here that also some, sometimes Jesus says some things that will make you scratch your head and wonder, why did Jesus say that? Does it, because I don't understand it or because I may not agree with it in the moment, does that make it less true? Absolutely not. It is true not because of what I think. It is true because Jesus said it. And Jesus is God. He is the final authority. And I have to submit, surrender and submit to that. Sometimes, does it make me happy? No. But my salvation, my relationship with him, as is yours, is not about happiness. It's about obedience. It's about surrender. It's about acknowledging the reality that he is God and I am not and never will be. One of the greatest struggles for human beings is that idea that we have this ability to control our lives. It's a real struggle. But the longer we live, the realize how little control we have, don't we? You can do everything right with your health. You can exercise like crazy, you can do all the, eat the right things and, and have that whatever percent body fat that's supposed to be healthy that I haven't had in, ever probably, but never will. You can do all that and still have health issues, can't you? You can do all the right things in a relationship, act accordingly, and still have struggles because one or two or maybe both of you have things that you didn't see that blindside us in relationships, don't they? We need God. We need the Holy Spirit's intervention in our lives. We need his encouragement. We need his strength. We need his wisdom as we navigate those things in life that can lead us astray from the path that God has for us. And John is reminding these believers the importance of that relationship with God and how that relationship is fostered and and grows when we obey the one whom we claim to love. I love how people will say, well, I follow God, but I don't do what he says. Really? I've heard that. Now, I'm not saying that we don't stumble. We all stumble. We all have days that we fail. Absolutely. None of us are perfect. Can I get an amen on that one? Because that's true, isn't it? I don't often beg for amens, but I thought that was a good point. I just think it is. We forget that. I forget that. Sometimes I think, I get confused, you know, sometimes. I'm sure this happens to no one else. Forgetting that I'm not as good as I think I am. And not as in control as I think I am. But God is better than I can even imagine. And God is in control of all things. And God can work in spite of me. And he has done that many times in my life. He has worked in spite of me, not because of me. In fact, more often than not, it's in spite of me. I just, sometimes I happen to be where he is and he shows up and does his thing and I'm just there. And that's the only credit I can take for what God does in a situation like that. And I'm grateful for that, that he is willing to use someone like me because I don't think I'm worthy of it. And I know I'm not. 
And you may say, well, I'm not worthy of it either. That's okay. Did you know your salvation is not based upon God, your worth, but God's grace? Isn't that a wonderful, freeing thing to think about? You cannot earn salvation. Cannot. Sorry to those denominations that think you have to do this extra thing besides trust Jesus to be saved. Sorry about that, that you're wrong. You can't earn it. It is freely given by the grace and power of Almighty God. You can receive it, but you can't earn it. And at the heart of this, this whole reality that I think John is talking about to these believers is he's encouraged them to follow him. He's trying to, I, th- I think they're struggling with that idea of, you know, I'm a follower, but I like doing all these other things as well. And John doesn't give a list of what they can't do. Because that's not our job as those who are called to communicate the word to, of God to people. We allow the Holy Spirit to make the list for you. I am not the Holy Spirit in your life. You can't do that job. And believe me, brothers and sisters, I don't want that job. I'll let the Holy Spirit do what he does. He's a whole lot better at it than I'll ever be or any of us will ever be. And he's the one that convicts, that directs, that guides us. You see, God gave, the Father gave him to us when we received Christ to indwell us, not just so we can be here, but so that we can experience who God is and hear from God and allow God to speak to us. Have you ever thought about how precious the whole gift of the Holy Spirit is? Got a question about the word, trying to understand? You can call your pastor. I'll try and help you. But you know the best way to deal with that and learn that and and to grow in the knowledge of the word? Let the Holy Spirit speak. Who knows more about the word of God, me or God? That's a dumb question, isn't it? It really is. And you know, as smart as, as, as John Piper is, and I respect John Piper immensely, I think Dr. Piper would agree with me on that same thing. He would say the same thing about himself. He understands that. We know as much as we can know, but God always knows more. I mean, we call this what? The word of what? God. Because it is not from man, it is from him. Yet he wants us to understand it. So how better to help us understand it than we have a 24-7 tutor with us living inside of us. You thought of the Holy Spirit that way? That's one example. I mean, that's, that's not the, he's not only that. That's not what I'm saying. Don't hear me say that. But that is one of the things he brings to us as children of God. He can teach us. His, we can read his word, and he can help us see it and understand it. And sometimes things that we may not quite get, if we just spend some time praying through it and allow him to speak, he will clarify things for us. I've had it happen to me on numerous occasions, multiple occasions. And this is what John, I believe, is trying to share with these brothers and sisters is this walk with God is so powerful, so beautiful, but it comes in surrendered faithful obedience because God is seeking to do something incredible with this world and with his church. I truly believe and hope also as well that God is about to do something that we've never seen in the church of Jesus Christ in our land and maybe in the world as general. I think he's up to something. Because you know, God's always got a plan. Did you know that? How many times does God's, do God's plans never work out? If you can't see in the back, these are double zeros. He is undefeated. He will never be thwarted. He will never be stopped. He will never fail because he is God. Now, how many times does Mike fail? I don't have enough, no, I don't have enough fingers, sorry. <laughs> I'd have to need, I'd need all of yours and probably more. That wouldn't even come close. And we serve that faithful, loving God that walks with us, that drives us, wants, us to, wants to encourage us and loves us and wants us to experience him fully. And that's what this is really about. When we follow him and we surrender to him, we can experience that. Because I think he's about to do something. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something, and we've got time to do it. Oh, yeah, we got time. we got all kinds of time, right? I, can, I was told I can go to 1 o'clock today. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's a joke. Everybody got nervous when I said that, didn't you? Oh, he's really going to do it today. No, it's not going to happen. Anyway, we're going to Joel chapter 2, if you would, with me. Joel is in the Old Testament. It's one of the minor prophets. But I want us to go all the way down. Right here, I'm going to make sure I get the right verse. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Down to verse 28. This is where in, in the end of this, we're going to look through the end of this chapter, 28 to 32. This is where 
the people of God in the Old Testament were promised what was going to happen, what we experience now as followers of Christ. It's, it's the promise of the Spirit. The day of the Lord and the promise of the Spirit. It begins in verse 28, and it will come about after this that I will pour out my Spirit on mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, God says. Then he says in verse 30, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved or delivered, it might say in your translation. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So in this text, Joel gives us a picture of the coming of the Spirit, but he also gives us a, coming, a picture of the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, that God will judge. He will do that. He will display himself. He will make himself known. There will be judgment coming upon this earth. But our hope is in, is in him. It's kind of like you hear me say a lot. If you, you have those movies where you want the good guy to get justice and the bad guy to get his just desserts, Right? Not what every kind of those kind of movies about those action films, you know, and you know Chuck Norris is the good guy, and some poor slops the bad guy, and they've been fighting the whole movie, but you know what's going to happen in the end, right? Chuck wins because it's Chuck Norris, right? It's a joke. Okay, you'll get it later. But anyway, that's what we hope for in life too, don't we? We believe that good will triumph. We hope that good will triumph. And then sometimes, though, you look at things going on in the world and you wonder, well, I'm not so sure that's going to happen. And I know that many of you have seen things more horrific than I can even imagine and wondered, where is God in the middle of that? And yet you have seen God be faithful in spite of those things and even through those things because God is faithful and God is always victorious. The darkest day in human history, in my opinion. Actually, the two worst days ever were Friday and Saturday. After our, first after our Lord was crucified, and then the day after. How much of a horrific day was that for his followers and his friends that had loved him? After what they had witnessed on Friday, after our Savior was crucified, whipped, all the horrific things they'd saw, they'd helped lay his body in a grave, and they're there gathering in that room wondering, what are we going to do now? Can you imagine what that was like emotionally to go through all that and to see that and then to wonder, I thought he was the Messiah. I thought he was the Savior of the world. He's dead. Not only did he die, it's how he died. He was publicly humiliated and, and shamed and, and disgraced. What do we do now? Those were some dark days can't imagine how dark that was for those early followers of Christ. Think of the disciples and the women that followed him and loved him and cared for him and what they were dealing with is they were just overwhelmed with grief and pain and loss and probably fear and anxiety and all those emotions, that those negative ones that we talk, talk, think about. And it looked like in those moments that God had lost, didn't it? It really looked like it. It seemed over. But what happened on Sunday? And you notice when God did that? He didn't wait till Sunday night. He did it early Sunday morning. About the break of day, or maybe even before the break of day. Now I wish, this is why I hope, I believe, I'm hoping that God had some videotape of that. That'd be awesome. To see it, I mean, what it really had. I mean, I've, I've seen it dramatized a thousand different ways, and they're all great. They're nice, try. I've heard it sung about, but I wonder what it looked like. I, I want the inside tomb view. I know it's going to be really, it's going to look like, like dark black, obviously, because it's a tomb. There's no light in there. And you kind of watch the power of God moving on the body of Jesus. It begins to maybe glow. I don't know. I'm just making this up because I don't know I wasn't there. I wonder what it looked like, though. Don't you, don't you hope that God was going to maybe show us that? Wouldn't that be cool? You know, you know it's okay. You don't get into, nobody else gets into video or movies or scenes, right? You don't do it. Nobody watches YouTube, right? Put that on YouTube. That would be awesome. And in that moment, 
everything that we have feared, everything that we had thought was wrong, every, all the defeat, all the anguish, all the anxiety melts away in a moment as we see he has won. It was all part of the plan that we didn't recognize in the moment. And neither did the disciples. They didn't figure it out. We read about it 2,000 years later, and we're still confused. I'm sure in the moment they were they just like, what? I don't know what's going on. And Jesus just walks out of that tomb. I don't know if he moved the stone away or the angel moved the stone away. Being God, I think he could do whatever he wanted to do. Don't know. And he just walks out and he is alive. The power of sin and death could not and never will hold my Savior or yours. Like he can't, it can't. He's too powerful for that. And we serve him and we follow him. And because of what he's done in our life, we have the hope of his grace, his mercy, his salvation. All of those things that he talked about and he pray, proclaimed to us, we have that incredible hope. And we celebrate that every Sunday that we gather. You realize that's why we meet on Sundays, don't you? We don't meet on Sundays because you don't have to work. Generally, I know some of you do, I get that. But we generally meet on Sundays, the first day of the week, because what day of the week did Jesus rise from the dead? Sunday. That's why you're here. You celebrate that every, so we, we talk about Easter, which is wonderful. We'll get excited about that here in a few months. That's great. But every Sunday is really Easter in a way, as a reminder of this, the resurrection of our Savior and Lord and what he has done. And we should celebrate that. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that I've been faithful to the, the text and to the message that you gave me to share with your people today. And, Father, that it communicated in a way that uh, exalts and glorifies you. Because that's really all it's ever been about, Lord, is glorifying and exalting you, letting others know who you are and experience the love and mercy of God that you desire to pour out upon us. And I pray, Father, that as we walk through this time, if there is one here today that has not come to know you as Lord and Savior, or even someone watching us on our, our live stream, that today would be the day they would surrender and give their life to you. We're excited for what you do in each of us as we surrender to you. We're excited to see how you move in might and power. And Father, we always want to see you continue to do that. And we just want to experience you and what you want to do in our lives and give you all the glory and all the honor for everything that you do in us and through us. Bless this time and use it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.